certificate says that I am Gwendolyn K. Smith. I really haven't been known by anything other than Gwen for almost as long as I can remember. And that's usually the way I sign my name, my checks and so forth, is Gwen K. Smith. And um, I was 93 years old on September the 8th of this year. Well, the family property was on Moore Street, uh, where it, right after it makes the, the turn that, that now goes straight up the hill to the Academy property. On the right-hand side, there was a two-story uh, wooden lumber house there that uh, my dad built in 1906. Now, that was before my time. Uh, in 1936, uh, that house was uh, torn down and the present house was constructed. Uh, there were only our property and about two other properties on that street at that time. We were literally in the country. This was, I was born in 1915, and uh, that's where that I was born there in the house that, that was there. And it, that, that's what I'm talking about when I say that there were just two properties there other than the Smiths. The reason why we were there is because my grandfather, Sylvester Smith, owned some of the property. He had visions of development there about where the San Marcos Academy is in that, that area. And the property that, that, that Daddy, my, Oscar Smith, my father took, was out down on Ranch Road 12, which at that time, of course, was just called the Wimberley Road. It was a road, it didn't have a number, and it was gravel, and it was dusty, and it was rough. So actually, I was, I was in the country. I played outside a lot. There wasn't anybody in the neighborhood much for me to play with. It was later on, there was. I liked being outdoors and liked that kind of life. Uh, there was an elementary school on West Hopkins Street in the 900 block. And uh, it was called Palm School. Sometimes it was called West End School. Uh, I spent the first six years of my schooling there and uh, that served that, 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 quote, end of town. And then when you graduated to the seventh grade, you went, came, went up the hill, went up Loop Street. You know where the Episcopal Church is now? Uh, at that site was East End School. And we, we spent uh, our seventh grade at the East End School. It was a rocky hill, I be, uh, a clue you. The building was rather typical, early 20th century brick. Not very pretty, but we didn't pay much attention to it. We were just busy going to school. Uh, it was it was a rocky a rocky playground. I know we, the kids fell down a lot. Then for high school, the San Marcos High School was over on Comanche Street at the site of the present Pennington Funeral Home parking lot. It was a brownish red brick building, not very pretty colored brick, very strangely architectured for a school building in that it was somewhat of an octagonal shape, which was interesting, but it made a lot of nooks and corners. Uh, people don't believe me. Uh, I've had uh, reason to tell people that our school colors at the time I was there was uh, were uh, Brown and white, and uh, they they don't they, they they dispute it, and I dispute them right back. <laughs> uh, it was probably changed around 1940, uh, but uh, I graduated in 1933, and uh, I had a tennis sweater that had was brown and white. I also have a memory book that's brown felt with white uh, lettering on it. So I have proof, but we were we were rattlesnakes. Still yeah, we were we were. But you see, who's ever seen a purple rattlesnake? The business started when uh, I get a group of farmers that had uh, farmland out towards Seguin on Highway 123 in that that area, and also east. Uh, you may know that. The, uh, the land around the east of town, as we know the town now, and adjacent to the San Marcos River was very rich farmland, black land at that time. Uh, 
they, they came to my dad and said, we want you to build us a gin and we want it to be uh, exclusively for our cotton seed because we want to get a good grade of lint uh, cotton from, from the sample so that we get a higher price for it. So uh, he agreed to, to do that. Uh, this building then was, was constructed in 1909. At that time then it was called the Farmers Union Gin Company. Now I want to make it uh, clear that they were not union people, meaning the work, the, the work, the labor union. It was a union of individuals who joined together. Well, that worked very well for, for my dad because he had customers that he could, had contracted with. He, they turned out a good sample. And uh, that went on for a number of years. And uh, he added on to this building the part of the building where the, uh, where the bar now is. And the reason for adding it on was because other farmers wanted to bring their cotton here, but they wanted to, the uh, farmers union section wanted to remain exclusively that section. So the, he built this other smaller gin to take care of, of other customers. Uh, and turned out a, a, a similar uh, uh, product. Uh, the interest, I find it interesting that the gin was powered uh, early on, of course, by steam uh, furnished by coal. If those of you are familiar with the location of the gin know that the railroad track is quite close. And uh, that, that was one reason why the gin was built here, because the railroad would bring in uh, coal cars they would be unloaded adjacent to the, uh, into the gin and didn't have to be hauled again. It was were loaded directly into the building and shoveled from the concrete floor right into the, into the boiler. Then as uh, the uh, time passed and in the 1930s, uh, he decided to do it with diesel fuel. So coal was no longer uh, the, uh, prominent fuel, and we went into diesel. And then later on, probably in the uh, 50s, 30 years, 20 years later, we went to electricity, and all you had to do was punch a button. So the gin has experienced three different kinds of power. Uh, I do want to say that uh, along about 1950, or possibly even before, it could have been during WW2, uh, Daddy bought out the original owners of the gin, the farmer's gin, because uh, he had these three, uh, four children, three sons, and uh, he wanted a business of his own. So when he, he, he bought out their stock and it became the O.C. Smith Gin Company Incorporated. And he, and he issued stock to, to his four children, myself included, who was, was the girl, the only girl of the family, but even so, I was on a par with my three brothers. So from then on, it was known as the O.C. Smith Gin Company. And then finally, due to the, uh, due to nylon and uh, it, 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 its impact on the cotton industry, and also the fact that uh, many of the farmers went into uh, feed crops that were more income producing than the cotton and not subject to cotton bow weevils and so forth. So we ceased ginning in 1966. So uh, the period of time was from 1909 to 1966. He, uh, he, he liked sturdy construction and he reinforced the, the, the building the, wherever he could see it to make it as stable as possible. He put in what we kind of jokingly call the rose window. It was simply an added uh, uh, amenity, so to speak, but being a somewhat German descent, we feel like that maybe, maybe his father, my grandfather Sylvester, might have had something to do with that. But anyway, it's there, and it's a little bit unique to find a window like that in a, such a heavy construction type of building. I used to come down uh, and uh, climb into the cotton wagon, and uh, you know, the, the, uh, the cotton is suctioned up from the wagon by means of air hydraulics and uh, 
I knew some of the farmers, and some of the farmers would bring their children in, and, uh, and the tenant farmers would come, sometimes bring their children. I'd climb up in the wagon and, and work the, work the uh, tube that had the, uh, the air coming up in it, just because it was fun. Lost a few straw hats in the process. But I never did actually do any work. I, I was too young to do any work at the time when it was in this business. I liked to hang around the office and watch my brothers open that big safe because the door was yay thick, and it was interesting to see that. Now, your, your uncles were also involved with Yes, gins. my uncle Arthur built the gin uh, on the San Marcos River in Martindale, which it, it still stands. And I understand that it has undergone, the building has undergone some reconstruction and restoration. And for a, long, for a number of years, there's been, there's been a, said that it will be reopened, as, not as a gin, uh, but as perhaps a restaurant or an entertainment block. But we don't know for sure. And then Uncle Fred also built a gin on the San Marcos River, just at Cottonseed Falls that you've heard about for the safari. And uh, it still stands. Uh, Hal Perkins has purchased it and uh, remodeled it into living quarters. He lives there with his family. Uncle Carl's gin was out on the Blanco River. Uh, I can't tell you the exact location of it. It was a smaller gin, and it did not survive. But uh, it, it could have burned, but I'm not sure. I, I lived at home and went four undergraduate years at, at Southwest Texas State Teachers College. And uh, I don't, I never did, I never did do work like soda jerking or anything like that. Uh, I, I had, I, I, I recall it as pleasant times. I was a member of uh, the impression of the Shakespeare Society. And uh, as I said, in 1936, I was a junior or senior in, in college. And that's when we built that present home, and there was a lot of property there. We built a badminton court, and we also built a croquet court. And uh, I had uh, students, friends, student friends over to participate in activities. I was a physical uh, history major, but at that time, but I wanted to teach physical education. But at that time, they didn't think enough of physical education to offer it as a major, but you could minor in it. So I took all the courses I could and had more hours in it than I did in history. But I liked history and I did student teaching in it, but I've never taught history a day in my life. Well, the college was very, very small at that time. In fact, there was one, there was one year that I was at that we had fewer than 1,000 students. And again, that's something that no one believes. But recently, I did hear uh, someone had done some research and they affirmed my not, not just my personal uh, memory, but that, that there were fewer than a thousand students there, which seems unbelievable now that there's always almost 30,000. The uh, stadium was on the old Austin Highway about where the parking lot is for, uh, for the present Bobcat Stadium, except of course it wasn't nearly as big as that. There were bleachers, the wooden bleacher style. Uh, Evans Field is- That was Evans, Evans Field. Field. Mm -hmm. Evans Field. And uh, we also had a, a thing that I remember very uh, clearly. 1936 was the Texas uh, Bicentennial, uh, Centennial, not Bicentennial, the first hundred years of Texas, 1836 to 1936. And of course, most towns and schools in Texas had big celebrations, and we were no exception. And I happened to be student teaching at the time, so I was really involved because all the teachers, no matter what they taught, math, science, history, whatever, uh, had, to, had their students taking part. Uh, I taught folk dancing, square dancing, and uh, we put on a show for them at Evansville. Of course, we had a kind of a, what they call a, a tableau in those days. We, we had to do some reenactment. We didn't know we didn't know it was reenactment. We just knew that we needed to have some horses and some cowboys and something that looked like Texas looked in 1836. By the way, H.C. Uh, uh, Kyle's father was named Henry Kyle. Uh, Mr. Henry was a local attorney and uh, quite famous because he was a good attorney and because he had some very definite opinions 
about life in San Marcos. Yes, and uh, he was a young man in 1936, mm -hmm. and uh, an attorney and educated and so forth. And I distinctly remember that he was chosen to be one of the uh, messengers, one of the uh, participants in the reenactment of the Texas Revolution. And he came galloping onto Evans Field on a horse. Well, that just brought down the, the, the crowd, of course, because they recognized him. And he was such a good sport to do it when he was uh, so completely out of his usual character. But uh, it was a lot of work, as I recall, and I knew that I had to do good because I was a student teacher and I, I wanted to make an A. I think I did, but I'm not sure. And uh, I distinctly remember my, my graduation in the summer of 1939 was held at Riverside, which was called, Rio Vista was called Riverside. Okay. And, and, Riverside, had, Riverside and Rio Vista are not the same thing, as, as you probably know. But Riverside was what Sewell Park is, is now called Sewell Park. And there was an island there. And uh, we held the commencement on the island, which was, it was in August and it was held outside. And it was a good thing because it was a little cooler there than, with caps and gowns than it would have been in Evans. Uh, my, bachelor, my baccalaureate, uh, the uh, undergraduate bachelor's degree was in Old Main. I distinctly remember walking up all those steps in Old Main and, mm -hmm. and graduation. That was graduation then was in June. Okay. We had uh, we we had swimming at uh, at Riverside, and another thing that we had that uh, I'm sure you've heard about if you've read anything at all about the history of the. Of, 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 the, of the college, as we called it, were these uh, water pageants that we had every every summer, and uh, Dr. Sewell, for whom the park is named, uh, put them on, and uh, we had swimming classes, and then some of the uh, swimming instructors would train some of the better swimmers to do what is sometimes called synchronized swimming. We had that in those days, but we we didn't know what we had. We just knew that that we could do tricks in the water and we could dress up our bathing suits and people would come to see us and give us a lot of attention and applaud. They, they, were, they were fun for, the, for us and the, the town turned out for them. They, they were, we were famous for so it. I, I taught here in, in the San Marcos Public Schools okay. for about five years. Okay. In the high school or? Uh, I had girls physical education from the fourth grade through high school. Oh, by the way, when I was in high school, we had only 11 grades. So when anyone asks, or when I tell someone that, I said, well, it didn't take us but 11 years. It takes you guys 12 years now to get through. Well, no, uh, the, uh, at the time, at that time, the elementary school was, this is 1939, 1940, 41, uh, was where Evans Auditorium is, in that building. Uh, the, I would go over and say at nine o'clock in the morning, go into that building, get just the girls because we had separated. Somebody else would take the elementary school boys and I would take the elementary school girls. Well, I was a coach for the high school girls. I had people like Patty Sullivan, you may know her. Uh, I had Mary Cohen Fitzpatrick. I had uh, one of the Holcomb girls, Edna Holcomb. I had Daddy Sims. Oh, really? uh, some pictures we would, we, we did not have a tough, competitive, long distance schedule. We played Kyle, we played Buda, we played Lockhart. Uh, I don't think Wimberley had a team at that time. We were very low key. We played it for the fun, for the recreation, and for the health benefits uh, that, that we had. We, um, I can distinctly remember that the, all of the teachers were uh, called upon to work with the rationing of issuing sugar stamps and gasoline stamps. And uh, we, uh, there was meat, meat was rationed. And uh, at that time, uh, I had a, a little toy Manchester dog. And uh, we used, I used to tease my mother because you had just certain so many points for red meat, and she would buy some hamburger meat, and invariably I would catch her giving 
Mr. Denny, which was the dog's name, a little piece of hamburger, which of course I was tickled to death that he was getting the hamburger, but I wanted to get, I gave her a hard time because there she was feeding family food to the dog. But, but she, loved, she loved him as much as I did. Uh, I, I, I think we had the usual drives for tinfoil, uh, by uh, bonds, uh, I mean, for the, for the young people, for the children and all. I even went to the, to the uh, extreme of buying a bicycle, which was hard to find, uh, because they were quit making bicycles because of the materials that went into them, rubber and steel and, and uh, iron and so forth. And we, we would have a, a, a drives for metal. My dad, uh, went into it full force. He he loved old machinery and, and anything mechanical, and he would buy up junk and, and accumulate it uh, down here around this building because uh, it was part of the war effort, and it also cleaned up the, the landscape. Yes, I, uh, I rode my bicycle to school from my home on Smith Avenue. Uh, a few, I didn't do it as much as I thought I was going to. It was a red western flyer. And uh, I, I enjoyed riding it, but I, I, it was too many hills for me. So uh, it took too long. I had to get up too early to make it to class on time. So I went back to the car, even, even with gas rationing. It, was, it wasn't much of a chore. And then uh, I, I took a job uh, in San Angelo. And while I was getting unpacked in San Angelo, I got a call from the Hockaday School in Dallas that they needed a teacher. And uh, this sounds strange to you now, but at that time, people were changing jobs at the drop of a hat, as they say. Because uh, for one reason or another, uh, of course, with, well, with, with husbands going off to war, with brothers, with families being disrupted in every way uh, by the war, uh, people were dropping jobs, they were looking for jobs, and so forth. I didn't have any of those problems. I was on my own, so I guess I, uh, took it to heart and said, I'd rather be in Dallas than San Angelo. <laughs> so I went to Dallas and I taught the junior college age girls in, uh, for one year. And then uh, again, it, a, a better job came along that was at the, uh, at the time was, Lu was Louisiana State Normal School, which was comparable to Southwest, Southwest Texas State Normal School. Again, it was a wartime job, but I could, I considered it a, a, a better professional job. They did have facilities, and I, I had student teachers, and I knew I could work with them. That was in Natchitoches, Louisiana. And uh, I stayed there one year, and by that time I knew that I wanted more education, and so I decided I, I really truly wanted to join the Marines. I really wanted to be a part of the action as far as the war was concerned. My, my mother looked with dismay on that, and uh, she said, nice girls don't join Marines. <laughs> and uh, I guess I was considered a nice girl. Anyway, I uh, deferred to her wishes, but I said, I, I want to do something, and I want, to, I want to be ready when this thing is over. So I chose the University of Iowa for graduate school. And the reason I chose it was because at that time, it was a leader among physical education and kinesiology, uh, biomechanics, and so forth. And another reason was that Oski Strand, for whom Strand uh, Arena is named, was my major professor here at Southwest Texas. He was from Iowa, and uh, he encouraged me to, to go to Iowa. And I had a better reason, which was because it was a good professional school. So that's where I went, and I stayed two years and got my PhD. And then when the, that was, I graduated there in, in August of 1946. And uh, the best job that I could find at that time was at Illinois State Normal University in Normal, Illinois, because they offered me the rising sum of $3,000 for nine months teaching. So I grabbed it because it was the best of the lot. Our, the, our department was well known over the Midwest because all of most of her professors were PhDs. 
they were people who did research. We were people who wrote articles and, and uh, went to conventions and tried to better ourselves in every way. So I ended up staying 33 years, but I never did lose contact with San Marcos. I came back every summer. I was fortunate that I never did have to teach summer school. I had been here, and believe it or not, I took the San Marcos record for most of the years that I was in Illinois. And uh, well, my brother, Max, was also county judge some of those years. And so uh, in talking with him, I kind of knew a little bit about what was going on in Hayes County. Uh, and the thing that, that strikes us now more than anything else is its transformation from a highly rural community into such an urban community. And, I'm all, and having said that, however, they are still very much, it's still very much rural in so many areas. I, I'm not qualified to, to speak to that with any authority. I just know that, that there's a lot of open space, and to me that's rural. There's a lot of pretty open space. And uh, I deplore the fact that so much of it has been covered with houses <laughs> because uh, I do think it, it's pretty country and I like it. I've always liked it. I didn't, as I said, I didn't know too much about it, but. It was, it, it was here and it was home. Well, I think um, trying to encourage people to appreciate the river and uh, do what they can to protect it. Uh, try to encourage care of the environment, beautification of the environment. Uh, I, uh, I helped found the River Foundation that's not a very good sentence, founding the foundation. <laughs> when was that? Uh, that was 1986, okay. and it, 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 it still is flourishing. Uh, we, uh, we, have we have tried to protect it. Uh, it's getting an awful lot of use now, and I'm, uh, I'm hoping that the access to it has not, is not going to spoil it, because, well, it, it, uh, it, it has to be used. It doesn't belong to us. It's, it's public property, of course. But we do have, uh, uh, we're stewards of it. And I want, I, I think we've done, I think the city's done a pretty good job, and the county too. Of, uh, I think they've coordinated their efforts to preserve the river, and at the same time give access to the citizens. And of course, that's, that's important. Because if they don't have access to it, how are they going to learn to appreciate it? And realize how unique it is and what a treasure it is. I'm chairman of the uh, Heritage Association Riverwalk Park Committee. Uh, we work in cooperation with the, the city parks and recreation in uh, landscaping and caring for Vermindy Plaza. It is a historic park. It's a small park. It's an urban park, and we want, we want to keep it as pristine as we can. Uh, I've been fortunate to have a, I've had a good committee and I have uh, received uh, uh, support uh, from uh, the Convention Visitors Bureau to, uh, for its role in tourism, bringing tourism to San Marcos. And uh, I, I had a meeting just yesterday, Tuesday, uh, with my committee, and uh, we are uh, planning some improvements to the park, not the kind that, that look like built, not built activities, but but uh, natural, natural environment activities. Uh, so that, that occupies some of my time. Then uh, I, I, have, I work, as I was on the original board of directors of the Price Senior Center, and uh, I was there for about seven or eight years. And now I, I go when called upon. I help out any way I can, whether it's financial or being a hostess or whatever. No, I'd just like to uh, express my appreciation to you the, and the, the Historic Commission. I was on the Hayes County Historical Commission for several years, representing the Heritage Association. I think Mrs. Stovall was the chair at that time, and uh, she saw to it that I attended all the meetings. And uh, Colonel Rogers, I know, was the secretary at that time. And we used to meet down at the courthouse, and uh, so, uh, uh, I, I'm glad to know that, that it's alive and well and doing some good things and if I can help out in any way, I'd like to do it. Mm -hmm.